Hello, we'll be continuing The Horse and His Boy in Chapter 11, The Unwelcome Fellow Traveler. When Shasta went through the gate, he found a slope of grass and a little heather running up before him to some trees. He had nothing to think about now and no plans to make. He had only to run, and that was quite enough. His limbs were shaking, a terrible stitch was beginning in his side, and the sweat that kept dropping into his eyes blinded them and made them smart. He was unsteady on his feet, too, and more than once he nearly turned his ankle on a loose stone. The trees were thicker now than they had yet been, and in the more open spaces there was bracken. The sun had gone in without making it any cooler. It had become one of those hot, gray days when there seemed to be twice as many flies as usual. Shasta's face was covered with them. He didn't even try to shake them off. He had too much else to do. Suddenly, he heard a horn. Not a great throbbing horn like the horns of Tashban, but a merry call. ti ro to 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 ho Next moment, he came out into a wide glade and found himself in a crowd of people. At least it looked a crowd to him. In reality, there were about 15 or 20 of them, all gentlemen in green hunting dress with their horses, some in the saddle and some standing by their horses' heads. In the center, someone was holding the stirrup for a man to mount. And the man he was holding it for was the jolliest, fat, apple-cheeked, twinkling-eyed king you could imagine. As soon as Shasta came in sight, this king forgot all about mounting his horse. He spread out his arms to Shasta, his face lit up, and he cried out in a great, deep voice that seemed to come from the bottom of his chest, "'Corin, my son, and on foot and in rags, what?' "'No,' panted Shasta, shaking his head. "'Not Prince Corin. I, I, I know I'm like him. Saw his highness in Tashban. Sent his greetings.' The king was staring at Shasta with an extraordinary expression on his face. "'Are you K King Loon?' gasped Shasta, and then, without waiting for an answer, "'Lord King, fly! Anvard, shut the gates! Enemies upon you! Rabidash and two hundred horse!' "'Have you the assurance of this boy?' asked one of the other gentlemen. "'My own eyes,' said Shasta. "'I've seen them. Race them all the way from Tashban.' "'On foot?' said the gentleman, raising his eyebrows a little. "'Horses!' "'With the hermit,' said Shasta. "'Question him no more, Darren,' said King Loon. "'I see truth in his face. "'We must ride for it, gentlemen. "'A spare horse there for the boy. "'You can ride fast, friend?' "'For answer, Shasta put his foot in the stirrup of the horse "'which had been led towards him, "'and a moment later he was in the saddle. "'He had done it a hundred times with Bree in the last few weeks, "'and his mounting was very different now "'from what had been on that first night "'when Bree said they climbed up a horse "'as if he were climbing a haystack.' He was pleased to hear the Lord Dan Darren say to the king, The boy has a true horseman's seat, sire. I'll warrant there's noble blood in him. His blood, eh, there's the point, said the king. And he stared hard at Shasta again with that curious expression, almost a hungry expression, in his steady, gray eyes. But by now the whole party was moving off at a brisk canter. Shasta's seat was excellent, but he was sadly puzzled what to do with his reins, for he had never touched the reins while he was on Bray's back. But he looked very carefully out of the corners of his eyes to see what the others were doing, as some of us have done at parties when we weren't quite sure which knife or fork we were meant to use, and tried to get his fingers right. But he didn't dare to try really directing the horse. He trusted that it would follow the rest. And the horse was, of course, an ordinary horse, not a talking horse, but it had quite wits enough to realize that the strange boy on its back had no whip and no spurs and was not really master of the situation. That was why Shasta soon found himself at the tail end of the procession. Even so, he was going pretty fast. There were no flies now, and the air in his face was delicious. He had got his breath back, too, and his errand had succeeded. For the first time since the arrival at Tashban, how long ago it seemed, he was beginning to enjoy himself. He looked up to see how much nearer the mountaintops had come. To his disappointment, he could not see them at all, only a vague grayness rolling down towards them. He had never been in mountain country before and was surprised. It's a cloud, he said to himself. A cloud coming down. I see. Up here in the hills, one is really in the sky. I shall see what the inside of a cloud is like. What fun! I've often wondered. Far away on his left and a little behind him, the sun was getting ready to set. They had come to a rough kind of a road by now and were making very good speed, but Shasta's horse was still the last at the lot. Once or twice when the road made a bend, there was now continuous forest on each side of it. He lost sight of the others for a second or two. Then they plunged into the fog or else the fog rolled over them. The world became gray. Shasta had not realized how cold and wet the inside of a cloud would be, nor how dark. 
The gray turned to black with alarming speed. Someone at the head of the column winded the horn every now and then, and each time the sound came from a little further off. He couldn't see any of the others now, but of course he'd be able to as soon as he got round the next bend. But when he rounded it, he still couldn't see them. In fact, he could see nothing at all. His horse was walking now. Get on, horse, get on, said Shasta. Then came the horn, very faint. Bree had always told him that he must keep his heels well turned out, and Shasta had got the idea that something very terrible would happen if he dug his heels into the horse's side. This seemed to him an occasion for trying it. Look here, horse, he said. If you don't buck up, do you know what I'll do? I'll dig my heels into you. I really will. The horse, however, took no notice of his threat, so Shasta settled himself firmly in the saddle, gripped with his knees, clenched his teeth, and punched both the horse's sides with his heels as hard as he could. The only result was that the horse broke into a kind of pretense of a trot for five or six paces, and then subsided into a walk again. And now it was quite dark, and they seemed to have given up blowing that horn. The only sound was a steady drip, drip from the branches of the trees. Well, I suppose even a walk will get us somewhere sometime, said Chasta to himself. I only hope I shan't run into Rabidash and his people. He went on for what seemed a long time, always at a walking pace. He began to hate that horse, and he was also beginning to feel very hungry. Presently, he came to a place where the road divided into two. He was just wondering which led to Anvard when he was startled by a noise from behind him. It was the noise of trotting horses. Rabidash, thought Shasta. He had no way of guessing which road Rabidash would take. But if I take one, said Shasta to himself, he may take the other. And if I stay at the crossroads, I'm sure to be caught. He dismounted and led his horse as quickly as he could along the right-hand road. The sound of the cavalry grew rapidly nearer, and in a minute or two Shasta realized that they were at the crossroads. He held his breath, waiting to see which way they would take. There came a low word of command. Halt! Then a moment of horsey noises, nostrils blowing, hoofs pawing, bits being champed, necks being patted. Then a voice spoke. Attend, all of you, it said. We are now within a furlong of the castle. Remember your orders. Once we are in Narnia, as we should be by sunrise, you are to kill as little as possible. On this venture, you are to regard every drop of Narnian blood as more precious than a gallon of your own. On this venture, I say. The gods will send us a happier hour, and then you must leave nothing alive between Caraparaval and the western waste. But we are not yet in Narnia. Here in Argentland, it is another thing. And the assault on this castle of King Loon's, nothing matters but speed. Show your mettle. It must be mine within an hour, and if it is, I give it all to you. I reserve no booty for myself. Kill me every barbarian male within its walls, down to the child that was born yesterday. And everything else is yours to divide as you please. The women, the gold, the jewels, the weapons, and the wine. The man that I see hanging back when we come to the gate shall be burned alive. And the name of Tash, the irresistible, the inexorable, forward. With a great cloppity clop, the columns began to move, and Shasta breathed again. They had taken the other road. Shasta thought they took a long time going past, for though he had been talking and thinking about two hundred horse all day, he had not realized how many they really were. But at last the sound died away, and once more he was alone amid the drip, drip from the trees. He now knew the way to Anvard, but of course he could not now go there. That would only mean running into the arms of Rabidash's troopers. What on earth am I to do? said Jasta to himself. But he remounted his horse and continued along the road he had chosen, in the faint hope of finding some cottage where he might ask for shelter and a meal. He had thought, of course, of going back to Erebus and Bree and Wynne at the Hermitage, but he couldn't because now he had not the least idea of the direction. After all, said Shasta, this road is bound to get to somewhere. But that all means by um, depends on what you mean by somewhere. The road kept on getting to somewhere in the sense that it got to more and more trees, all dark and dripping into colder and colder air, and strange icy winds kept blowing the mist past him, though they never blew it away. If he had been used to mountain country, he would have realized that this meant he was now very high up, perhaps right at the top of the pass. But Shasta knew nothing about mountains. I do think, said Shasta, that I must be the most unfortunate boy that ever lived in the whole world. Everything goes right for everyone except me. Those Narnian lords and ladies got safe away from Tashban. I was left behind. Erevis and Bree and Huyn and all, are all snug as anything with that old hermit. Of course, I was the one who was sent on. King Loon and his people must have got safely into the castle and shut the gates long before Rabidash arrived. But 
I get left out. And being very tired and having nothing inside him, he felt so sorry for himself that the tears rolled down his cheeks. What put a stop to all this was a sudden fright. Shasta discovered that someone, or somebody, was walking beside him. It was pitch dark, and he could see nothing, and the thing, or person, was going so quietly he could hardly hear any footsteps. What he could hear was breathing. His invisible companion seemed to breathe on a very large scale, and Shasta got the impression that it was a very large creature. And he had come to notice this breathing so gradually that he had really no idea how long it had been there. It was a horrible shock. It darted into his mind that he had heard long ago that there were giants in these northern countries. He bit his lip in terror. But now that he really had something to cry about, he stopped crying. The thing, unless it was a person, went on beside him so very quietly that Shasta began to hope he had only imagined it. But just as he was becoming quite sure of it, there suddenly came a deep, rich sigh out of the darkness beside him. That couldn't be imagination. Anyway, he had felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. If the horse had been any good, or if he had known how to get any good out of the horse, he would have risked everything on a breakaway in a wild gallop. But he knew he couldn't make that horse gallop, so he went on at a walking pace and the unseen companion walked and breathed beside him. At last, he could bear it no longer. Who are you? he said, scarcely above a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. His voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are you, are you a giant? asked Shasta. You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I am not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard. Then, for an even more terrible idea had come into his head, he said almost in a scream, You're not, not something dead, are you? Oh, please, please do go away. What harm have I ever done you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that is not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father or mother and been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and of all their dangers in Tashban and about his night among the tombs and how the beasts howled at him out of the desert. They told about the heat and thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus and also how very long it was since he had, any, had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, said Shasta? There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there was at least two the first night, and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion, and as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. Then it was you who wounded Erebus? It was I. But what for? Child, said the voice. I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, said, so that the earth shook, and again, myself, loud and clear and gay, and then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it, and yet it seemed to come from all round you as if the leaves rustled with it. Shasta was no longer afraid that the voice belonged to something that would eat him, nor that it was the voice of a ghost, but a new and different sort of trembling came over him. Yet he felt glad, too. The mist was turning from black to gray and from gray to white. This must have begun to happen some time ago, but while he had been talking to the thing, he had not been noticing anything else. Now the whiteness around him became a shining whiteness. His eyes began to blink. Somewhere ahead he could hear birds singing. He knew the night was over at last. He could see the mane and ears and head of his horse quite easily now. A golden light fell on them from the left. He thought it was the sun. He turned and saw, pacing beside him, taller than the horse, a lion. The horse did not seem to be afraid of it, or else could not see it. It was from the lion that the light came. No one ever saw anything more beautiful or terrible. 
Luckily, Shasta had lived all his life too far south in Kelmoran to have heard the tales that were whispered in Tashban about a dreadful Narnian demon that appeared in the form of a lion. And, of course, he knew none of that of the true stories about Aslan, the great lion, the son of the emperor over the sea, the king above all high kings in Narnia. But after one glance at the lion's face, he slipped out of the saddle and fell at its feet. He couldn't say anything, but then he didn't want to say anything, and he knew he didn't say anything. The high king above all kings stooped towards him. Its mane and some strange and solemn perfume that hung about the mane was all round him. It touched his forehead with its great tongue. He lifted his face, and their eyes met. Then instantly, the pale brightness of the mist and the fiery brightness of the lion rolled themselves together into a swirling glory and gathered themselves up and disappeared. He was alone with the horse on a grassy hillside under a blue sky, and there were birds singing. And that's all for now. <laughs>